So just a few words about him. Father Mark Toops uh, is a Catholic priest of 22 years in the Homa Diocese, um, or excuse me, Homa Thibodeau Diocese in South Louisiana. He's currently the pastor of Our Lady of the Isle, uh, which is on Grand Isle. In addition, I think this is very important, he's the founder uh, of the Ministry for Priestly Support. And don't we know they need that? A ministry for priests providing both spiritual renewal and executive coaching. He's an adjunct leadership consultant for the Catholic Leadership Institute and an adjunct faculty member at the Institute for F Priestly Formation. He's authored nine books and has four eight-week video series. If you're like me and you kind of struggle reading, you can listen uh, or watch. He's also uh, most known for his Ascension resources, Ormus, a Catholic guide to prayer, the Rejoice, Advent Meditation Series, and the Lenten Companion Series that a lot of you are familiar with. He's got postgraduate degrees in theology and philosophy, as well as a bachelor's uh, degree in history. And I was just talking to him, and it, it kind of hit me. I'm pretty sure he's the only author at the festival that is not the author of the book that he's going to talk about. So, <laughs> Father Mark, please. Thank you very much. Well, it is a gift for us to be together today. Um, the topic today is uh, 101 Beautiful Things About Bert Sestia. So hopefully that's why you came. We're going to start with number one. He's a great introducer. Um, as, um, as Bert said, um, it is a, a gift for me to, uh, to cross the boundaries of two dioceses. So to leave the, the beauty of, of Homa and Thibodeau in Grand Isle area and to be with you here in South Central Louisiana. So I want to say... Uh, just how grateful I am for the privilege to be with you. I uh, do want to say a word of welcome to our out-of-town um, visitors. It's great to, to have you in South Louisiana. Uh, we have real estate agents outside of this, so you can buy a property on your way out. So, We have uh, 45 minutes this morning. Here's what I'd like to do in our 45 minutes. I'd like to reserve uh, 30 minutes where we can have a conversation about the Bible as a literary work. I'll answer uh, three questions uh, with regards to the Bible as a literary work. That will reserve 15 minutes for some Q&A. Uh, we can talk in that time. You can ask questions either about the presentation itself. I can take you deeper into any point that you would like clarified. Or if you have questions about any of the other resources that we will sign after um, that I've authored, then we can go there. If you have any other questions about life, the date of the second coming, Super Bowl champions, Bert will be up here to give you all of those answers after. So... Let me also, um, uh, as a prelude and an introduction, say that uh, to discuss something as universally debated and complex as the Bible, especially from a literary perspective, would take a lot longer than 30 minutes, which is what we have reserved for here. I have made some presumptions this morning, and that if um, that was an incorrect presumption, then let me just apologize to you now and I'm willing to have some private conversation with you afterwards. I am going to presume that almost all of us in here, as you come to this talk, have a basic familiarity with the Bible as a book. You understand that there's an Old Testament and a New Testament. You understand that the main character is Jesus Christ, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with those things, but we'll highlight some nuances there. But it's my hope in this talk to answer three questions uh, with regards to the Bible as a literary work. Number one, um, when you look at the Bible itself as a book, how did it come to be? Uh, number two, we're going to talk about can the Bible be trusted in its literary integrity? In other words, the Bible is writing it about events, especially the New Testament, that happened in a very specific place, time, with a very specific person. Is there any literary evidence that helps us appreciate the integrity of the text as a book that can be taken seriously? And then number three, um, what do we do about this main character in the Bible, especially the New Testament named Jesus Christ? So that's where we're going to go. Hopefully, as you came in, you picked up notes to the talk. Um, I'm going to use these uh, extensively, uh, mostly because I think that it's easier for you to kind of unpack things as you can take this home with you, and it's easier for, to not have to have all of that on a screen behind me. So without any further ado, join with me on page one, the front of there, the, the cover there, 
And let's talk about the historical development of the Bible. We're going to begin with the Old Testament, and then we're going to make our way into the New Testament on page two. So the Bible, how did it come to be? Well, the Old Testament obviously is all of the Jewish scriptures. So even our good friends who today would identify as Jewish, they would, they would recognize most of them, the, the books of the Old Testament, the 47, 46 books of the Old Testament that we have in several versions of the Bible now. The Old Testament we would refer to as the Jewish scriptures. Obviously, the New Testament you can refer to as, you might say, the, the, the Christian scriptures. How did the Old Testament come to be? Well, it, it, it developed over time. Uh, we, we have to remember that as we are at a literary festival, that the phenomena of having written text is certainly um, uh, much younger than the whole span of civilization. Especially even 2,000 years ago at the time of Jesus, the number of people who would have, um, who would have access to books would be relatively small. The number of people who would have read would be re- relatively small. So for, for most of humanity, the way that you transmitted um, stories was through oral tradition. Right, so the oral tradition of the book of Genesis, the oral tradition of the book of, of Deuteronomy, the oral tradition of the Psalms, that would have been shared from one generation to the next orally. And eventually those oral stories were written down into what we know as manuscripts for the Bible. Now, at the time of um, at the at the at the time where Jesus enters into the equation, we're gonna call that zero, right? Uh, with timeline, 200 years before that, um, uh, or 300 years before that, in, in Egypt, um, and I'm going to pick it up here on, on, on the first point, number one, um, the, the king of Egypt had one of the, the largest libraries in the world, and he, he wanted every major book in the world in his library. And while he was not Jewish himself, and while he was not necessarily a believer in the, 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 the God of Judaism. He wanted a book of the scriptures from uh, the, the Jewish uh, uh, scriptures. And so he commissioned um, the greatest biblical minds at the time to come to Egypt, to Alexandria, and to produce for him uh, an original manuscript of the Jewish scriptures. Now, this is at the time of, of, of the Greek, the Greek um, influence in the world. And so the language of writing at this point was Greek. So at around uh, 200 BC, um, the greatest biblical scholars in Judaism, 200 years before Jesus, they gather and, and he says, write for me. What is the Old Testament? Write for me the Jewish scriptures. And those, those, uh, that, that work came to be known as the Septuagint. Say that with me. Septuagint. One more time. Septuagint. So the Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Old Testament that was agreed upon by the highest scholars 200 years before Jesus was born. At the time of Jesus, um, when Jesus went to the synagogue on Saturday, um, they would have had Hebrew manuscripts of of the Old Testament that they would have read in the synagogue. At the time of Jesus, let's just say that there are two camps out there within Jewish biblical scholarship. Um, You might say the scribes. They would have As you know, the scribes and Pharisees, the scribes would have had a much more limited understanding of what they thought would be in the Old Testament. But the majority of Jewish scholarship at the time of Jesus would have considered the Septuagint to be the normative, to to be the Old Testament in its integrity. This is important as we get into the development of the Bible as a whole many years later. Look at section two in the bottom of page one, right? So the 2.1, the Septuagint is completed in approximately 200 BC. 2.2, it has 46 books in its manuscript. At the time of Jesus, some scholars approved its legitimacy, some did not. And um, the the, the bone of contention here is, is whether or not you have a copy of the Old Testament 
books in Hebrew. So, for example, in some versions of the Bible today, in the Old Testament, you'd have a book called Maccabees, which is about the Maccabean Revolution um, under the Greek occupation of, of, of the chosen people. Well, well, there's no original Hebrew manuscript that we have today. So a minority of Jewish scholars would have said, if there's no Hebrew manuscript, it's not inspired. However, the majority of Jewish scholarship at the time of Jesus would have said, that's actually incorrect. If that we believe that there are other things that, that make legitimate these Greek versions of a Hebrew story. This is important. The language is going to be significant here as we go to the Old Testament. In summary, Old Testament comes together. Uh, we, we, we can say that we have some pretty clear direction 200 years before Jesus is born about what the books of the Old Testament are. Flip the page over. Let's talk about the New Testament. It's important for us to know, especially those of you who may be avid um, followers of the Bible, uh, and for those of you who have a great passion for the Bible, uh, Jesus did not own a Bible. <laughs> Some pe sometimes people are like, oh, I never thought about that, right? Um, after Jesus is, uh, is crucified on Good Friday, ri rises from the dead on Easter Sunday, ascends, right, on ascension, and, uh, and goes back to heaven, uh, the early apostles didn't have a Bible. That's important for you to know. In the, if Jesus died in the year 33, in the year 34, there's no Bible. All of the stories that they are proclaiming are passed down through oral tradition, which had been very uh, typical of civilization back then. Look at section 3 on page 2. The first written manuscript that we have of the New Testament, uh, depending on um, what school of scholarship you look at, would be around the year 50. Right, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew being an apostle of Jesus, um, his gospel is attributed to about the year 50. Uh, around that time, St. Paul writes his first two letters to the, um, to the Thessalonians. We, we have that letter dated, but there is no written text on paper before the year 50. So from the year 33, for 17 years, from 33 to 50, all of the stories of Jesus are passed down orally from generation to generation, from person to person. Right, the word disciple literally is translated as disciplos, right? So a disciple would have been a student of a master, and the role of a disciple would be three things. Number one, you would uh, t learn the teachings of the teacher, you would teach the teachings of the teacher, and you would try to live like the teacher. So every great teacher back then had disciples. We know John the Baptist had disciples. Jesus had disciples. Well, so did Peter. So did Paul, right? If you look at um, the next line there, uh, in the year 60, uh, one of the the cousins of Barnabas, John Mark, he was a disciple, a student of both Peter and Paul. He writes the Gospel of Mark, and the earliest manuscript that we think we can date with integrity is in year 60. Year 62, Luke, who was a student of Paul, writes his Gospel, and then we believe the accurate date of the actual authorship of the Gospel of John is in the year 98, which is why we believe John the Apostle was very young when he followed Jesus, probably 20 years old, because at this point in his life, he would be in the latter chapters as he is in exile, uh, in prison in Patmos. Right, so the Bible comes together. It's important for us to just put this together, right? The Bible comes together on written text within 50 years. Starts in the year 50, ends around the year 100. We have manuscripts of the entire New Testament by that time. Let's go to section four, right? So by the end of the second and third centuries, Christianity is, is growing. And there are lots of documents out there. Um, uh, so let's just use some, some local geography here. The people uh, in, in, in Lafayette, they have copies of the Gospel of Mark. The people in Morgan City, they've got this thing called Luke. The people in Baton Rouge, they, got, they have a Gospel according to Thomas. It's a little different um, doesn't seem to be consistent with that manuscript that they're using over there. So let's go back 2,000 years ago in the Holy Land. After Jesus, Christian communities are popping up. They're popping up in Israel. They're popping up in southern Greece and Turkey. And there are these floating manuscripts that are out there. And they're all talking about Jesus. However, some of them are saying things that are kind of hard to kind of believe is true if you compare it to the other two. So the, 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 the biblical scholars and, and the third century got together and said, okay, we have to make a determination 
Which of these manuscripts can be trusted and which of these manuscripts should not be used for official teaching? And that's what emerges there. Look at 4.3. Right? So the best and brightest biblical, uh, biblical scholars of the day in the 3rd and 4th century get together and they use three criteria in 4.3. Which of these manuscripts should be used? What's the date of the manuscript? Let's stop right here for a second. If I tell you, I want to tell you about the life of Abraham Lincoln, and I have a document from 1870 from an eyewitness who was with Abraham Lincoln, that's very different than if I have an original manuscript, and the earliest date of the original manuscript is in 1976. They're both about Abraham Lincoln. Don't you think that the one that is closest to the eyewitness would be more reliable. Because you're going to watch the Discovery Channel, and they're going to talk to you about these other Gospels that the church has, has taken out. Well, that's because they were written 200 years after, and they claim to be eyewitnesses. Like, so there's a lack of chronological integrity in it. Number two, is there theological consistency? Gosh, all of these documents say that Jesus um, died on a Friday. This one says that Jesus rode a purple elephant and flew up in the sky, right? Uh, I'm making that up, right? If there's some theological incongruency, that there's a red flag there. And then finally, um, can it touch an apostle? Because there were 12 who were there for all of it. And so if the document was written by a disciple of an apostle or by an apostle itself, then it has a little bit more integrity, so 4.4, in the year 414, right, 419, the greatest biblical minds had already met twice at this point. The greatest biblical minds at the time in the year 419 get together, and they say, okay, these books, these seem to be inspired by God. These other ones, man, they may have some historical relevance, but we can't say that the words there are absolutely inspired by God. So this happened over a, a, a several, um, several meetings to unfold here at these ecumenical councils, right? But in 419, um, the best biblical minds that we had at that time said, okay, there are 27 books in the New Testament. These are the ones that you can trust. Now watch what happens. In 419, the best biblical minds of the time, they say, and the Old Testament is the Septuagint. So they grab the Septuagint and they put their authority and their, 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 their stamp on those 46 books of the Septuagint. And they said that there are 27 books in the New Testament. Let's just kind of keep going because um, there are different versions of the Bible out there. And it all revolves around um, uh, lots of dense biblical debate around the Old Testament. Let's just say that there is a, uh, I don't like the categories of Protestant Bible and Catholic Bible. I think that's limiting. I know lots of Catholics who read a Protestant Bible and lots of Protestants who read a Catholic Bible. I know lots of Catholics and Protestants who don't read the Bible. So <laughs> let's, just, let's just talk about the historicity of the document itself. There is a version of the Bible that is dated into the 5th century. And there's a version of the Bible that is dated into the 16th century. In the historical phenomena known as the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther and other leaders of the Protestant Reformation had some legitimate questions about faith. Some of those legitimate questions about faith touched on some biblical questions. For example, some of the, the, the authentic scholarship questions in this time, in the 16th century, would have revolved around, well, if there are 46 books in the Old Testament, only 39 of them are quoted by other books in the Old Testament. Does that make sense? So if, if somebody in the Bible is quoting another book in the Bible, then that offers some legitimacy to it. But there are seven books, at least seven books, that, that, that aren't quoted by, by anybody. St. Paul never refers to 2 Maccabees. Uh, Paul never quotes the book of Sirach. So in the New Testament, if there's no, there's no direct connection to some of these books, there was, there was a good biblical question, scholarship question about, well, well did they get it right? Because remember, at the time of Jesus, 
Right? There was a minority opinion of Jewish scholars who did not believe that the Septuagint was the, the canon of Scripture. The word canon means the, the recognized books, right? Well, the reason why um, uh, the fourth century, the fifth century Bible used the Septuagint is for this reason. Uh, the Bible wasn't written in English. Okay? The original documents of the Bible are written in Cajun French. Um, <laughs> You didn't know that, but Jesus was actually from Gadon, right? So, just kidding. So we have Hebrew or Greek manuscripts in the Old Testament, and we have fundamentally Greek text in the New Testament. We have to translate that into English. The Septuagint Greek is very unique. It's distinct to the Greek spoken in the Egyptian empire. When Paul is quoting Old Testament books, he's using the Greek translation from the Septuagint. So even though some of the books in the Old Testament aren't quoted by New Testament authors, the manuscript that they are using um, is, is, the, is the Septuagint. So that's where some of the disagreements get. So anyway, long story short, because of some of these biblical questions, in the 16th century, the Protestant Reformation Bible that came out removed seven books from the 6th century Bible. Does that make sense? All right. So you had an original manuscript of 46 books of the Old Testament. You have a 16th century document that takes out seven books Right, and so so that's the discrepancy between the two versions of the Bible that we have today. All right, flip the page over. Uh, the the question remains: uh, can, can we trust uh, this New Testament? This New Testament is making claims that Jesus did some pretty dramatic things. He he he, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. Can, can you can you even trust that the document itself that we have on paper? is actually connected to the oral tradition. Remember, there's 17 years that the stories were passed down from generation, from, from person to person. How do we know that the Bible that you have in the year 2023 is faithful to the oral stories that were passed down from person to person? Well, we use in a, a literary um, a use here, textual criticism. And what textual criticism is gonna do is it's gonna take a look at two things. It's gonna take a look at the gap between the event and the manuscript, and it's going to then call into question how many manuscripts do you have, right? So something happened, somebody wrote about it, and then how many copies of that do we have? That's, that's basically what we're trying to do with textual criticism. The more copies of the manuscript you have, the more legitimate you can say the claim is, and the shorter the gap between the event and the manuscript, the, the, the more solid you feel. Does that make sense? All right. Let's take a look. Number seven. 7.1 to 7.4. No one, from a literary perspective, questions these documents. These authors and documents are in universities across the world. No one questions the Greek, histor the Greek historians or, or the Roman historians, right? We, we, we say, okay, those guys are legitimate, right? With seven point run. So, so Herodias and um, he, he, he wrote about something. The earliest manuscript we have is 1,300 years later, and we only have eight copies of that, right? Roman historians, right? We have 1,000-year gap. He said this happened. The earliest document we have is 1,000 years later, and we only have 20 copies of that, right? The book, The Gallic Wars, the book, The History of Rome, 900 year plus gap between the event it's talking about and the date of the manuscript and we only have 10 to 20 copies of those. So I want you to see, okay, these are, no one from a literary perspective at a literary festival would ever question these documents. You have a massive gap between the event and the, and the manuscript and you only have a handful of manuscripts. Now, let's take a look at the textual criticism of the New Testament. The New Testament is written in between the year 50 and 100 A.D. By 130 A.D., we have um, manuscript evidence of a, a body of the New Testament. We, we have full manuscripts by the year 350. There are 5,300 Greek manuscripts today 
and 10,000 Latin manuscripts that date back to 100 to 300 years after the event happened itself. All right, so the number of manuscripts that we have is, is astronomical, and the gap between when it happened and when we have a manuscript is short. Right? I would dare say that there is no book from antiquity that has the textual criticism integrity as does the New Testament. Now, you may be a non-believer, but you cannot be a literary technician and doubt the textual criticism of the New Testament. As a literary work, it has robust evidence that the words that are on paper are reflective of what was passed down in the oral stories. Now, you may not believe that what's on the page actually happened, but we can be sure that the textual criticism says we have an accurate representation of what those oral tradition is. Right? Number eight at the bottom of page three. That the persons of the New Testament existed is historically confirmed by historians outside of the New Testament. Number 8.2, the events written about in the New Testament are supported by objectively undeniable textual criticism. And number three, that the events written in the New Testament requires page four. Flip the page over with me. Now, this is just uh, me musing with one of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis. Um, if you disagree with C.S. Lewis, you can take it up with him. <laughs> if you have access to his voice, I would like to talk to you after the presentation. However, I do want to go out, if I can, in four minutes and 47 seconds, um, a very dangerous use of words around the subject matter of the New Testament. Uh, something cannot be true and untrue all at the same time. Uh, St. Thomas's principle of non-contradiction, it's philosophically silly, right? Either something is true or it's not. Gravity exists or it doesn't. Jesus never claimed to be a nice guy. Jesus never claimed to be a prophet, nor did Jesus ever claim to be a good teacher. However, there are people out there, as they look at the Bible, who would say, well, Jesus, I don't believe he was a Messiah. I just believe he was a good teacher. Let me at least attempt to remove that as a philosophical possibility for you today. 9.2. This is from C.S. Lewis. I'm going to read this at length. I hate to do that with you, but please read it with me in silence. C.S. Lewis says, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. This is one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can sh shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him the Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. You have three options, and three options only, with the guy of the New Testament. Number one, Jesus is either a lunatic, he's a liar, or he's the Lord. If G Jesus claimed to be God... He never said he was a nice guy. He is the only religious leader who ever intently drew attention to himself, right? Um, Confucius would never say anything. He'd say, follow the way. Mo Muhammad, he talked about Allah. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, I am the gate. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and life. Jesus said, e eat my flesh, right? Jesus is the only religious leader in the history of any religious phenomenon who intentionally draw attention to himself that we take seriously. If he was not, but he thought he was, then he's crazy. So if he's not God, he thought he was, he told everybody he was, then he, he's just crazy, he's a lunatic. If Jesus was not a lunatic, 
and he told everybody he was God, and he knew he wasn't, he's a liar. In both of those circumstances, his words are deceiving. Now, you can say what you want. You can have your own personal opinion about whether Jesus is who he says he is. But historically, you cannot deny there is outside of the Bible historical evidence that there was a guy named Lazarus who was dead and who was raised from the dead. We have, biblical, we have non-biblical historical evidence supporting some of the miracles in the Bible. It doesn't seem like a lunatic would have the power of the miracles that Jesus performed. Number two, it doesn't seem like someone who lied would have that lasting effect. Consider this. There were 12 apostles. Judas took his life. That gives us 11. John died in prison. That gives us 10. 10 apostles spent three years with Jesus. And every one of them remaining, all 10, died a horrific martyrdom. No one recanted. Peter, crucified upside down, never recanted. Thomas goes to India, died a horrific death, never recanted. It seems as if you spent three years with a guy who was a liar, that at some point, when faced with a horrific consequence of proclaiming his name, that you would eventually recant. None of them recanted. He's either a lunatic, evidence kind of makes you think, or he's a liar, evidence kind of makes you ponder, or he is who he says he is to which we're all in different places in our own life, on the journey of life, I, I'd leave that something for you to ponder what your response to that might be. But philosophically, there's only one of three answers to that question. But it cannot be that Jesus was a nice author of a book that we can look at at a literary festival and say, huh, Jesus, well, let's add it up there with the seven habits of highly effective people. <laughs> you can't do it. Right? It, it demands a in philosophical investigation. That puts us right at 12 o'clock, and I promised to stop in 30 minutes so that we would have 15 minutes of Q&A. So at this point, we have 13 minutes. So I'm happy to answer any question about anything that I presented to you in the text. I'm also happy to answer any question about any of the books that perhaps some of you may have read or about other projects that I'm working on. So with that, um, I'm happy to have a, a rebuttal from the crowd or an opposing argument or, or question or happy to engage in conversation with you and with whatever would serve you. So at this point, we'll open up the floor. Any questions or comments from all of us today? I think we have one here and then one in the back. With all those many So um, uh, th that's a great question. So if you did not hear the question, the question is, with regards to the manuscripts that we use for textual criticism, um, how do we handle discrepancies within those manuscripts? Um, remember that those are simply the manuscripts we have prior to the fourth century, most of them prior to the third century, all right? So those are the ancient manuscripts that we have. Um, within the approved 27 books of the New Testament, um, we don't have any theological or his historical contradictions. We do have some translation questions. Maybe there was a version of Greek used here or a version of Greek used there. But in those manuscripts, we don't have Jesus having four brothers here and yet Jesus not having brothers here. There are no conflicting. In other words, those are the manuscripts when we weeded out all the other ones that were contradictory, those are the ones that all came into symmetry with each other. So the, the, the actual physical words, uh, the nuances of the different uses of Greek and things like that may have some nuances, but there are no like major theological discrepancies that we have to deal with. In other words, and, and that's what's stunning uh, around the, the, the textual criticism of, the, of those manuscripts. Yes, sir. So when you were talking about the um, in the second century Septuagint and the early Jewish 
Yep. And when they, at what point did, um, I guess, the scholars look at their manuscripts and transition away? Did they keep, I, I know they, their Torah, they progressed on. So you mentioned that they supported it in the second century, but they don't support all the same books that we have now in 46, correct? That's, that's a great question. So uh, let, me, let me frame it for you this way. Um, number one, in the year 70, right, so this is uh, 37 years after Jesus died, the Romans, the Romans sacked Jerusalem and the, the Jewish people were exiled. There is, there is no Holy Land in the year 71. How long were they exiled? Until World War II. Okay. The chosen people didn't go back to the chosen land until the treaty after the Second World War. They were in exile for, 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 for nearly 2,000 years. That influences the, um, the, the organized collaboration within all that is in Judaism, if that makes sense. There's no center for, for Jewish spirituality and biblical scholarship that is recognized by all Jews across the world, right? The exile has a lot to do with this. So some factions of Judaism would use the Old Testament as, that is known as the Septuagint, and some would not. And that is influenced by the exile as much as anything else. Um, so today, um, uh, who, who is the Jewish authority on the Jewish scriptures? There are as, there are as many intra-Judaic um, uh, divisions as there are inside Christianity, right? So there are Orthodox Jews and, uh, and secular Jews, and et cetera, et cetera. So it is hard to, to pin down um, that. At the time of, of, of Jesus, remember, it was an unsolved question. There wasn't 100% of agreement. There were the majority and the minority. And when the exile happens, it only it, it increases the distance between those two and then breaks up the cohesion within those groups. So... So I don't know if that answers your question, but at least it's, a, uh, it's an additional comment to it. When the uh, Septuagint was written or recorded, were there, uh, was it just a, a recordation of the oral traditions, or were there some prior written documents that were worked into that? And then the same thing when uh, Matthew's gospel, when he wrote his gospel, were there some little written papers and stuff like that prior to that that were used to record those uh, documents? Yeah, you're bringing me back to two of my favorite things, um, bourbon and the seminary. Uh, <laughs> these are the types of things that we used to debate in the seminary. So at the time of the writing of the Septuagint, yes, there were several um, uh, approved written manuscripts in Hebrew of some of the Jewish scriptures. Um, uh, I don't know if there was a, a there was not a single Hebrew of the 46 books that they translated into the Greek 46 books, right? It would have been a combination of whole manuscripts, partial fragments, and some of the oral tradition. Uh, certainly, or even some of the non-recognized written tradition uh, of some of those Greek, um, uh, those, some of those seven books. So you would have had the, the book of Genesis, you would, have had a, you would have had a written scroll of that. The prophet Isaiah, you would have had a written scroll of that. You may have had fragments or independent Greek documents of Maccabees or Sirach, right? But there was no single Hebrew document that they simply translated. They brought things together in that process in writing the Septuagint. Does that make sense? In the New Testament, yeah, we can get into this much later on. There seems to be this mysterious document, Q, which we don't know what that is, but there seems to be a manuscript that both Matthew, Luke, and Mark drew from. We just haven't found it. There are like some striking similarities outside of just oral tradition amongst them. So we do believe that there were some, some fragment, fragment manuscripts that those authors would have used. Um, some of those we haven't been able to find. Some of them we have been able to find. Um, so it would have been a combination of oral tradition and um, some written uh, manuscripts uh, in the writing of the of the, the gospels. Yes, sir. Um, so, like the Protestant Reformation. 
absolutely. Great question. Um, what's your name? Brent. Brent, uh, what, what grade are you in? 11. What do you do for fun? You got to give me something. You, you, you play video games. You fish. You okay? You play video games. Um, uh, the, here's here's how you win in video games. You you press a button, and you win. Right? Okay. You can't reduce the strategy of effective gaming down to a singular statement. That would be not only a misrepresentation of the subject matter, but that would be unfair to you as someone who's there. With all due respect, to reduce the Protestant Reformation as a phenomenon, as well as the Catholic Church's response to a singular statement of sellers and indulgences, would be an incorrect portrayal of history, a misreputation of Martin Luther, a misreputation of some of the theological um, drive of the Protestant Reformation, and it would just be bad history, right? So I'll play video games with you, but if we're going to play, we've got to play the whole game. Uh, I'll spar with you here, but we're not going to throw Luther or the church or history under the bus with a small statement like that. Make sense? Luther had 99 questions, not one, right? But you can't put 99 questions in a tweet, right? And so what has happened as, as a... There's a philosophy of history that says history is more written by the history books than it is by those who enacted the history, right? There were lots of things that Luther had a problem with. Almost all of them were legitimate. One of them was the selling of indulgences. The selling of indulgences has not been a practice in the Catholic Church since the Protestant Reformation if we're using the selling of indulgences in the way that it was used in the Protestant Reformation. So the, the Catholic Church does not believe in the selling of indulgences. If it did, I would not be a Catholic, right? That is, that is anti-biblical and it's immoral. So the church does have, the, the, the Catholic Church does have um, a really rich biblical way of understanding our response to heaven. That would take me a little bit more than than, than 17 seconds in response. Um, and, and it does require us to think a little bit. But just for the, for the record, um, um, I'm not quite sure if the official position of the Catholic Church throws Luther under the bus, at least today. Um, when I was in the seminary, and I was ordained in 2001, in 1999, um, the theological leader of the Lutheran Church and the theological leader of the Roman Catholic Church signed a document stating that we both believe in the same thing when it comes to salvation, believe it or not, right? So in the contemporary, if you're going to take legitimate sources of Catholicism, I don't think they are at this point throwing Luther under the bus. I know some uninformed Catholics who are, and I know some uninformed Protestants who believe crazy things about the Catholic Church. We can't, we can't do all that. Um, so that's a great question. Uh, and so in defense of Luther, he had great questions. In defense of Luther, I don't think that we would throw him under the bus, at least from the official point of the church. And to help us appreciate the church, there was a lot more going on than just selling indulgences. In the end, um, we, will, we, we will all be judged by God for our integrity, and, and the church has to get its act together on that stuff right there. But great question. Yeah, so, so Christine, you're referring to the, uh, the, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, I'm mindful of the time. It is 1214. I can take as many questions as you want, but I want to respect the rhythm of the festival here. So I'll do the best I can to answer this question, but somebody yank me whenever you, you want to clear the room. Okay. <laughs> if you don't know, the, in, the 19, in, the, uh, in the mid 20th century, there were... Um, ancient scrolls that date back to uh, the time of Jesus that talk about the life of, of, of the Jews. They talk about a lot of things. Some of it we know and some of it we don't know. 
Um, this was, <laughs> was uh, they were in these ancient um, um, storage containers and they were sold and somebody opened up the, this vat and said, oh my God, these ancient manuscripts that are there. They were written by the Essene community. The Essene community, who are they? Well, when you read the New Testament, you're familiar with the scribes and the Pharisees. You never hear about the Essenes. The Essenes were like the theological think tank. They are the, like the, the Navy SEALs of Jewish theology, all right? They are the best and brightest minds within Jewish scholarship. They had a ritual of, um, of, of bathing for purity. And there was a guy who was with the Essenian community for a long time named John the Baptist. Why does he baptize? Well, that would have been an Essenian practice that he would have been schooled in. Um, remember John the Baptist's dad is Zechariah, well respected inside the Jewish community. He, he sends his son to hang out with the Essenians. So the Essenians, super bright, very well respected theological minds of Jewish scholarship at the time. These dead, these dead Sea Scrolls, they talk about the life of the Essenian community and therefore paint a picture of what it would have been like at the time of Jesus in the Jewish community. A portion of those scrolls have been translated by non-Jewish scholarship, and a, a, the far majority of those scrolls are still in Jerusalem um, under the care of, of, of Orthodox Jewish scholarship. And, and they won't release their copies for, for anyone else to translate. There is the speculation from the documents that we have that, that, that the Essenes may have believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Is that part of the conspiracy theory of why the Jewish scholarship hasn't released their portion of the Dead Sea Scrolls? But that's what you're referring to, and, and that's what they point to. So I was fascinated. Um, thank you so much for the fantastic uh, presentation. Yeah, you're welcome. Fascinated by... Uh, Yeah, so again, whenever you try to explain something in a 30-minute talk, you run the risk of, of, of limiting it. Uh, and so out of, out of respect for um, um, the question that was in earlier, there are lots of legitimate reasons why the 16th century biblical scholars called into question the inclusion of those seven books of the Old Testament. They had great questions. Some of it has to do with... Um, the, the presence of an original Hebrew manuscript. Um, I, I appreciate the question about the, in the Protestant Reformation, especially the, the selling of indulgences. Um, there, 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 there were some theological questions that we know that Luther had as he, we look at his, his manuscripts himself that seemed to paint, um, we, we don't know, if there would have been theological reasons why they would have been removed. There certainly would have been theological questions about something like purgatory and the biblical evidence of, of, a, of, a, of a Catholic understanding of purgatory comes specifically from Maccabees. And so because that was such at play with indulgences, um, you can speculate, but I would hate in a, a, a more academic presentation like this to, to bring in speculation. So there, there are some, some theological questions there. Um, I would love to turn it over to biblical scholars like a Dr. Brent Petrie or other biblical scholars. Like turn it over to them. They can give you all of the reasons. There's the Council of Jamnia question, which would have been um, a, a first century AD gathering of a small minority of, of biblical scholars who would, have, who would have doubted the Septuagint. There's all kinds of stuff in there. I think to boil it down to the basic stuff, you would stay with the literary questions, uh, but there are some other reasons on both sides of the fence um, why you would, you would want to have a conversation together. I think what, what, where my heart grieves the most when it came to the, to the 16th century is the inability for all of the Christian scholars to get at the same table and have conversations. That was, that's a sin, uh, and, and I regret that that has happened.
<laughs> That's right. Yeah. I've never really, I've thought about it, but I've never really delved into it and actually delivered a message on the Maccabees. Have you? Um, I have not, ever. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a great quote from a, a, a Protestant uh, uh, preacher, Andy Stanley, uh, who I follow regularly, and he says, uh, every word in the Bible is inspired, not every word in the Bible is equally applicable. Right? So... There are references in the book of Exodus that if your children are not listening to you as parents, you should take them to the elders. And if they don't look, listen to the elders, you should throw them down the hill. <laughs> I would not recommend that we go home and apply that reference from the Old Testament, right? So there are some, uh, while we, 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 we would agree that every word of, in the Bible is inspired by God, uh, that's not all equally applicable. So I have, I've only used Maccabees when I have tried to help um, those I'm, I'm in front of understand um, the afterlife and the process of, of um, maximal receptivity to heaven. Um, people ask me all the time, well, what does the church teach us about purgatory? I'm like, the church never taught that about purgatory. I wouldn't be Catholic if they did, right? So purgatory is one of those things that I, I, I reference in Maccabees as um, after the battle, he, they prayed for the dead, right? And, and so just praying for the dead, what does that mean? But that's the only time I've ever really used it. Um, I've, I've preached on Maccabees once before when I tried to help people appreciate um, the fact you can only serve one God. So at the end of the battle, they, they saw the Jewish soldiers who were wearing pagan God um, medals and things like that. Uh, but that's probably the only other time I've, I've preached on Maccabees. So... Thank you again, Father. Welcome. Welcome.